Okay, welcome back. I hope you join me for part one. And if you didn't, you can click over here to watch it or I'll put it at the very end of the video so you can click there, okay? But in part one of this two-part series, I um, am talking, well, in both of these videos, I'm talking about what's a healthy relationship and how do I get one? So in part one, we talked about the basics of that just to basically answer that question in a nutshell which is, yeah, a healthy relationship has the power to um, hurt you, but an unhealthy relationship has the power to destroy you. Big difference. There's a lot of things going one way and out of balance in these unhealthy dynamics. And, but I did you know, clear up, hey, healthy relationships, they have fights, they have breakups, but it's how it's done is a key difference. And I talked about that in that portion and also dispel the myth that dependency is bad. No, it is not bad. What's bad is when it's one-sided, one way. What we're going for in a healthy dynamic is mutual reciprocal dependency, which is interdependency. So um, I did talk about unhealthy people, okay? Um, Codependents, the overgivers, which could be, you know, empaths, um, and also um, uh, the other unhealthy person would be independent people who are very detached, very empathy deficient, yes, possibly narcissists, okay? And definitely uh, those are the people, the type of relationship dynamics that we want to avoid because you're not gonna be able to get a healthy relationship when you're dealing with people who are coming from this type of background or programming in relationships. And yes, some of us, we are those people, we identify as that. So this is about deprogramming from it and getting this new program of being a healthy person in a healthy relationship. And that is what part two is about. So what are healthy people? Well, they're people who can be in an independent interdependent relationship where there's mutual attachment, mutual emotional attachment, and the empathy is reciprocal, it is shared. Now, um, a healthy person is somebody who is self-reliant, but at the same time, they're able to share support with another. You know, in part one, I gave this example of uh, preschool kids at daycare learning in those formative years how to share and play nice, right? <laughs> um, well, the interdependent person knows how to play nice, right? And make sure other people are playing nice with them too and not running them over, right? It's a balance, okay? What they do is they hold themselves and other people responsible for their own emotions and decisions. They are emotionally connected, but they're not dependent on people when there's some kind of lack of reciprocation going on. They're not going to stay dependent on that connection. And they have connections that uh, don't force another person to be responsible for their happiness. They're not fixers, saviors, problem solvers, but they present themselves in this role of helper, supporter to someone who is responsible for their own life. They do have high empathy, but also high boundaries. Notice in part one, I talked about the empath who has high empathy, but low or no boundaries. And I talked about the independent uh, who has, um, no empathy and very high boundaries. So this is the best of from each person and discarding that bad stuff, okay, from, from each of those unhealthy types of people. With a high empathy and boundaries, what these uh, healthy people do is they, they care and they show they care, but they're still responsible for themselves and their own actions, while at the same time, they're offering supportive connection to another person who is also being responsible for their own self and their own actions. And they do make decisions for themselves that are in their best interest, that are self-loving, while acknowledging the impact it is having on others. They care, but they make intentional choices to take action based upon their core values, okay? So yeah, you know, you might really be interested in somebody who's in a rough marriage and they're trying to get out and gee, I'd really love to get involved with you, but my core values here are that I don't wanna be in a third-party relationship, therefore I'm not going to. 
why don't you try to reconnect with me when you're ready to prioritize me in a relationship, right? And they don't see this through a lens of failure or not being worthy. They're basically seeing red flags in people and they're taking decisive action without fear of loss. Oh, I'm never gonna see this person again. Well, what if I never have love like it again? Or a sense of desperation that they're being rejected or that they're being injured they separate themselves from being violated, right? Uh, from being treated like uh, option B or, or a non-priority in somebody's life. Yes, it might hurt them to put those boundaries up and separate themselves from somebody who is not ready to prioritize them. Yes, that might hurt, but they don't let this person destroy them by repeatedly, consistently making them feel less than, right? And they set realistic expectations of other people. They see very clearly, this is what I can expect out of this person right now, and this is what I can't. And they're able to separate themselves from people who are not going to respect boundaries and are not going to meet their needs, either because they're unable or they're unwilling. Now, the interdependent person is someone who is not just self-referential, but they're also other referential. It's a balance, okay? It's not going to this either extreme where the, the codependent is somebody who's very other referential and the independent who might be a narc or how he's an overtaker, she's an overtaker. Uh, this person is very self-referential, right? The interdependent person has found this healthy balance of being self-referential while also um, other referential and there's a clear understanding of who's responsible for what in their own life and they support their partner in becoming the best that they can be and this person is going to support you in becoming the best you that you can be because they know that even when you are the best that you can be you're still going to want to be with them right they're not insecure they're confident and there is definitely mutual effort being made, matched effort. And this is a person who is willing to negotiate. They're conveying to you in word and deed, hey, I care and I wanna help you get your needs met. And I am willing to work this out. They can unite with another person without losing themselves. And each person is then able to fulfill their own needs and wants because each person is dependable and can depend on others. They're both self-reliant and able to be reliable to other people. Again, you notice it's neither extreme, it's the best of both worlds balance. It's not either or, it's and. <laughs> In relationships, uh, a healthy person is gonna be socially and relationally open, conscientious, extroverted and agreeable, not agreeable to a point that maybe the um, overgivers, the codependents, empaths are, right? Where they, they are overly accommodating, right? No, they're not gonna compromise their core values for somebody else, but they do come across as generally speaking agreeable and um, not this introverted, holding shy, insecure. This is somebody who's really going to assert themselves uh, in their relationships and they are conscientious and they're going to let you know in word and deed, hey, I was thinking about you and what do you think about this and that type of thing. And they're open to hearing other people's perspectives and input. They practice equality, mutuality, and reciprocation. They want to make sure that the two of you are on the same page. They want vulnerability also to go both ways. This is not somebody who's acting like they're interested in, you know, getting to know you, but really they're getting into all your dirty little secrets. And, and have you ever had relationships with people like that where they get you to open up and divulge things, but they never divulge anything to you, right? Be very careful about these people. These are people who want you to share on that deeper level and then they return it by sharing with you at a deeper level. So it's shared, right? You know some things about them that are deeply personal and private and vice versa. This is not somebody who wants you to be an open book, but they remain a closed book. 
In relationships, they come into agreement with people based on what is acceptable versus what is not. And they're very clear, like if they know within themselves, I cannot accept being in a third party situation, they're not going to. Maybe this other person can. Yeah, let's have a three party situation. But the other person deep down knows this is not really acceptable for me over the long term. So, um, you know, they come into agreement with people based on shared values of what's acceptable and what's not. And there's joint decision making. There isn't this, I'm going to lord my will over another. I, it's, it, this person really sees the value in or the power of agreement. And they know that if I make a decision apart from my partner and I don't have their support, ultimately I'm creating a win-lose dynamic where we all end up losing. Uh, but at the same time, they don't feel like they need to fix or save others in order to feel okay about themselves and their life. The main takeaway with healthy people uh, is that their connection with others doesn't cost them their independence, and their independence doesn't cost their connections. The thing with the relationships I think we have to really understand is that... Um, it's probably our most important life work, okay? Our life's work um, to learn how to love and be loved by others. And it gives us an opportunity to learn to show up as our best selves and to share this with others as they are doing the same. But Unfortunately, a lot of people see relationships as an opportunity to get something out of another person, right? To leverage power or um, influence or resources or whatever, um, rather than looking at relationships as an opportunity to invest in self and others. When we miss that opportunity, I think that what we learn is that no relationship is better than an unhealthy one. And I've definitely learned that in codependent, independent slash narcissistic relationships. I have learned that, um, you know, that's a codependent fear of not having others, not being supported, not having connection, right? That's our fear. But when we have to face that fear, because we learn, wait a minute, I'm actually alone anyway with this person. They don't really support me. Um, as long as I'm not giving them something, as long as I'm not giving them something, they don't want me. You know, they only want me for what I can give. So, hey, I'm alone anyway. You know, once you have to face that fear, you start realizing actually no relationship is better than an unhealthy one. And I got to say, a lot of people are in these very intense relationships, which I've talked about in my other videos. Um, that you might want to check out. I talk about it in my book, Healing from Narcissistic Abuse. Whatever label you want to put in it, on it, whatever label makes you feel comfortable, codependent, narcissist, runner, chaser, twin flame, whatever, these kind of dynamics where there's lack of balance and interdependency, you have to realize this is not sustainable, right? When you're dealing with really high highs of emotion and low lows of emotion, and it's constantly this kind of, you know what I'm saying? Like that, ups and downs with this person. Yeah, it might be very intense, and you might feel that there's an intense connection, but it's not sustainable. In a healthy relationship, yeah, there might be some good days and some bad days, but you keep trying to even and balance it out, right? It's not these... <laughs> like that, all right? That's just not sustainable. And I think as we heal, we start realizing what's sustainable and what's not. And unfortunately, that painful feedback from life could be that person that you had such an intense connection with, unfortunately, painful as it is to face, you can't sustain that connection with them because they're unhealed. And it might be that they're unwilling to be healed at this time. So, if you want to get in a healthy relationship, number one, avoid the unhealthy ones, okay? I, we talked about what the, how to recognize uh, unhealthy people in part one. And, you know, I've mentioned it in my other videos, how to spot emotionally unavailable people, what women want. I talk about it in my book. It's on Vimeo. It's on Kindle this month, which is October 2019. I should be releasing it to Amazon print. 
Um, and hopefully by the end of the year, I'll have it on Audible in audio format, the healing from narcissistic abuse, how to recover from empathy deficient relationships and uh, emotionally unavailable people. I give all the information about how to avoid these kind of relationships in the first place. That's the simplest strategy, avoid the toxicity, okay? But also, can you really recognize a healthy relationship from an unhealthy relationship? I mean, not just, okay, that's people, but in relationship terms, what does it look like if you've never been in one? I mean, in a healthy relationship, there's going to be challenges. And that's fine. That's life. But in an unhealthy relationship, there's going to be a feeling of limitation, a lack of control, a lack of power that somebody has trapped you or boxed you in. You don't feel empowered. You feel disempowered. And like I said, there could be fights or arguments or disagreements in a healthy relationship, which is fine so long as there are apologies and acceptance of responsibility. But in an unhealthy relationship, there's no resolution because there's blaming going on, guilt tripping, nobody's accepting responsibility. And even if they are apologizing, they're not backing the words up with consistent effort or it's not being reciprocated. And, you know, in a healthy relationship, there's openness, transparency, authenticity, vulnerability. But with an unhealthy relationship, this person is hiding things. You don't really know where you stand with them. You don't know how they really feel about you. They leave you feeling unsure about yourself. And um, maybe because they make you feel secondary, which makes you question yourself, your value, the role in the relationship. Like, I don't know, are we having a relationship? Is this a commitment? I mean, you said you want to be committed, but I mean, to what degree? I mean, well, you said you're leaving your ex, but you keep going back. I mean, it's all of this blurred boundary stuff, okay? which is going to make you feel less than and sec secondary. Whereas in a healthy relationship, somebody is going to prioritize you, which is going to make you feel sure about where you stand with this person, what your role is in their life and in the relationship. Um, and yeah, this is going to be with somebody who is open to negotiate. Yeah, because you share values and they're not asking you to compromise your core values. Whereas, you know, an unhealthy person, they're non-negotiable all around with their core values and anything, desires, intentions. It's like my way or the highway, whether they openly say that or, you know, quietly say that um, because they're not saying what they mean and they're not meaning what they say, whereas a healthy person would. And this leaves, a, it might be coming from a fear of fully expressing oneself, which is kind of making the other person afraid to fully express themselves. And this might bring about a lot of disagreements. But again, if you're in a healthy relationship and there's misunderstandings and agreements, there's going to be apologies, right? There's going to be, they're going to use this to understand the other person even better, to come into agreement, to work together with one another, not against one another. Whereas in an unhealthy relationship, uh, you're going to get silence from this person. The silent treatment, they could pressure you, they could bully you into agreeing with them. Well, I'm sorry, but it's got to be this way for now. You know, that type of thing. Well, you don't agree with me, but I'm going to go on and do it my way anyway to force you into supporting me with something that you don't want to support me on. Like, you know, starting a business at an inopportune time or, you know, walking off a job and being irresponsible. So definitely um, in a healthy relationship, both parties share values. Each person is self-aware, they know their personal desires, they know their limits, their, their values, but in an unhealthy relationship, there is a lack of self-awareness. If you're in a healthy relationship, both people are self-aware enough to know that they are a flawed human. <laughs> And they know what their flaws are, but they still value themselves at the end of the day and they value another. They know that person's not perfect, but they still love them anyway. Whereas unhealthy relationship is involving people who have low self-worth. Maybe they were shamed for their flaws or 
uh, they felt like they have to disown or repress these flaws or they do that to other people. Oh, why do you want that? Why do you value that and make you doubt yourself and think, you know, there's something wrong with you for, let's say, wanting a commitment, okay? Um, I had somebody do that to me one time. But when you are really self-aware and you have self-worth, you come back and you're like, no, because this is who I am. I'm a person of commitment. It's not because I'm weak or I'm insecure. It's because I am a person of commitment. And if you are not, I am secure enough in myself to release you so that I can come into commitment with somebody who shares these values with me out of a place of security, right? <laughs> yeah, that'll shut them up. There's also in a healthy relationship an exchange of energy and effort. In an unhealthy relationship, the efforts are not being matched, unfortunately. And it's like you're constantly wrestling with this person for equality. You're trying to constantly prove that you deserve better. And maybe they want you in that dynamic where you, you are trying to get their attention. You're trying to get their approval. And they like that. They might be really unhealthy and feed off of that crap. But I'm going to tell you some action steps to take to respond if you're in this situation, particularly if you're in a relationship with a narcissist or somebody who has this parasitic type of personality. You got to work on yourself first. Um, you need to work on being um, more self-aware, knowing yourself better, and doing the self-healing work. Um, realize that you can't keep doing this, right? If you keep going through this motion, this trap of feeling like um, this is what you have to put yourself through to get love from this person, you have to reach a decision in your mind, a clear-headed decision, a commitment that I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to stay in this trap of feeling like I have to do this in order to get love from this person. And you've got to be willing to break the cycle of this perpetual thinking of I'm not lovable unless dot 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 fill in the blank with whatever I'm not lovable unless I sacrifice myself for this person unless I pull my weight and theirs in this relationship um, unless I wait on the sidelines until they're ready to commit or they're ready to leave that partner the ex completely behind you know fill in the blank um, and you got to break this cycle of feeling like you only matter when you're of service to others. You, you got to know that's coming from an unhealed space in your childhood. And know that once you get that healing and clarity within yourself, you are not going to need validation from other people. You're not going to need agreement from them um, to a point that you feel like you're gonna compromise your core values for their benefit and at your loss, right? You're not gonna let people tell you what your role is. Oh, you're my side chick. Oh, you're plan B if plan A relationship doesn't work out for me, right? That's pretty disrespectful, but no, you set the roles and you're like, oh, heck no, honey. Let me tell you what, I'm nobody's side chick and I'm nobody's plan B. And you know what? Um, if, if, if that's what you think I am, that's not my role. That's not what I believe or will, will, I'm willing to accept as my role in your life. And you just don't compromise on this anymore. You don't compromise yourself, your core values, your integrity for another flawed human who is likely imposing their flawed beliefs upon you and trying to get you to adapt and to conform to them and accommodate them, which is super unhealthy. It's just a setup for failure. Don't do it. Don't let other people set your standards, your flow, your pace and relationships. Be true to yourself, honor your feelings and your intuition and expect people to relate to you. Be very concerned if they're not. And I said this in my book, I'll say it again. You have got to stop emotionally. If you're, if you're an empath, stop emotionally attuning to people who are not emotionally attuning to you. Be very aware of this, notice it, and respond appropriately when people are not attuning to you. You've got to respect yourself because if you don't respect yourself, then people are not gonna respect you. We've also, as empaths, we've gotta know the difference between fixing and supporting, right? 
um, fixing is, is carrying your load and theirs, which you were never equipped to do in this life. Spiritually, you cannot do it. Eventually, you'll fall out and collapse from it, and you'll be depleted, drained. You will be resentful, angry, injured as well. You will feel violated, and rightly so, because it is a boundary, major boundary violation. And so what you need to do is frame things as, how can I support you with your decision, right? And how can you do the same for me, right? Expecting and allowing people to reciprocate the support that you're giving them. It's not you're fixing their problems, you're supporting them as they're fixing the problems. And you are expecting that they do the same in return. Also, we have got to um, make sure we are clear on self-love versus selfishness. There is a difference, and there's a lot of people who get this confused, even in the self-help com community. Self-love is about, yes, having good boundaries, um, but it also proposes win-win solutions, whereas selfishness is a lot of win-lose scenarios being proposed, which ultimately puts everybody uh, in the relationship or the, the group dynamic at a loss. And so if somebody comes to you, for example, and says, I need you to make a decision for me. I need your help. I need you to rescue or solve my problem. Let's say, oh, wow, I got put in jail again. I need you to come bail me out. Well, is that a loving decision for you to make, particularly if this person keeps putting themselves in jail over and over again, and you keep bailing them out over and over again? Um, no. Oh, I need you to co-sign on a loan for me because my credit's bad because I keep messing up my credit. So let me, uh, you know, give me an opportunity to mess up your credit too. No, <laughs> that is not a self-loving decision for me. And put it back on them and say, you know, I would really love to help you uh, and support you in your decision to correct this, this challenge that you're having in your life. However, uh, the way that you're asking me to do this is not a self-loving decision for me. It makes me... Um, financially or emotionally vulnerable and you know I need to be making a decision that is not only protecting your interests but also protecting mine and yes if they challenge you and pull these guilt trips and you're a bad person and maybe even scare taxes you don't help me then I'm not going to be able to pay you back and you're going to lose your house or car or whatever who knows you know um, then you need to ask this person why would you ask me to make a decision that is not protecting my best interests. You need to put it back on them. Show these people, reflect back to them the selfishness that they are really asking people to consent to and accommodate. And finally, be willing, be willing to invest in yourself and others equally. Make sure the effort in your relationships is matched. Be aware when it's not. Again, when the emotional attunement is not balanced, you, you've got to avoid over identifying with victim narratives because a lot of times these people who are parasitic, narcissistic, uh, they don't come across as overt all the time like I'm here to take all your money. Nobody's going to outright say that up front. You would clearly run off in the other direction. The reason why people get exploited is because they get duped into believing this person's hard luck story, which it might have been self-created, self-induced injury to get other people to come in and rescue them from the consequences of a problem they have no intention of solving on their own. Uh, they have no intention of changing their behavior, but you want them to, uh, uh, they want you rather to accommodate unchanged behavior and so be aware of these kind of victim narratives um, and a lot of times empaths will identify with narcissists with their victim stories because we come from a, a shared background of these childhood traumas or having a childhood that's been cut short um, where we want to be the fixer we want to be the rescuer and the savior because we so badly wanted someone to do that for us in our lives and we have that soul wound of not having it so you know i'm going to tell you if you're in a situation like that i talk more about it in my book and my other materials but you know what i've done personally to release myself of the guilt let myself off the hook no longer be confused about you know, my responsibilities to this person, the relationship is that I ask myself, 
this question. If they don't care enough to rescue themselves, then why should I? Yeah, important question. Well, hey, I've talked a whole lot in this video about unhealthy people and healthy people and how to discern a healthy relationship from an unhealthy one. And I hope that I've given you enough information to be rock solid and clear. And of course, if you want to know how to, you know, get more healing, um, make sure that you check out my Healing from Narcissistic Abuse series. I'll have the link down below. And if you haven't seen part one, check it out over here. And until next time, I'm wishing you guys all the best. Be blessed.